mother at 16 Brought years old. Two bedroom mm -hmm. Used to sleep on, on the, the age floor. of seven years old. You discovered your dream. You wanted to become an NFL player. You used player. to get up with your father on Saturday mornings at 5:30, and used to run miles the and miles. First game of sophomore season. You tore the ligaments was out for your season. junior year. You broke your clavicle the first game. Out for the season. When college scouts would come in to see you and they would say, man, you are extremely son, talented. You just don't know if you're going to make it out of high school, let alone college. He said, son, there is no way that you will make it. Coach Philip Foreman from the University of Tennessee came into Crim High School. Yeah, I want to offer you a scholarship to go to the University of Tennessee. He said, coach, I'm coming. The reporter was making a beeline to Johnson, you even think you're going to play at the University of Tennessee? I'm going to start at the University of Tennessee. You played a little bit your freshman year. Sophomore season came, you broke the starting line. you got as strong as you had ever been. a student of the game you had ever been. 315 pounds. You call your grandmother, you call your mother. You say, after this year, our lives are about to change forever. Second game, you guys are playing against Air Force. You guys found yourselves in the dog fight. Fourth quarter, Air Force had just went down on side, kicked the ball and dropped. Air Force. Recovery. You guys broke the huddle. You called quarters come. Running back slips out of the backfield. Man's coming down your side. Quarterback released the ball to the running back. Running back catches it. Got the pass caught. Stop. I'm standing between you and the rest of your life. Where do your strength come from? Where do your drive come from? Where do your motivation come from? Where do your perseverance come from? Everything that you've ever been through, everything that you've ever faced, you've had the ability to overcome. You've had the ability to persevere. Everybody that ever made a sacrifice for you in your life, everybody that ever believed in you, everybody that ever gave you an opportunity in your life, you can't let them down. And I can't stop you. I can't stop you even if I wanted to. I can't stop you because you're about to get stronger. Carney back. Got the pass caught. Well, we got a Tennessee player. It's Inky Johnson who's down. People ask you all the time, if you can go back to September 9th, 2006, that game against the Air Force, and you can stop that moment, or you cannot play in that game, or you knew this situation was about to happen, would you change it? I can't stop this moment because of the people that believed in you and the people that sacrificed so much for you, the people that saw something in you and you couldn't see it in yourself. To your grandmother, to your mother, to your mentor, to your father, to your family members, to your friends, to the people that looked to you and were inspired and were encouraged and were motivated. You had overcame so much. And by doing that, it gave so many other people strength. So I don't want you to deal with the disappointment of thinking that you disappointed them because your dream has left. I can't change it because of what's about to happen. But even if I could, I wouldn't. And thank you guys for that. I'm an energy guy, but I felt that one. You know, um, it's always great. I travel, I travel across the country, but it's always great to be able to come home and share and serve. You know, so this is extra special to me. But I firmly believe in gratitude, and so I want to express my gratitude to Jeff and Plywood. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. It wouldn't be right. My wife is here. If I didn't express my gratitude to my wife for putting up with me every day, and my two children, we got two six-year-old Irish twins, 11 months apart, so they keep us going pretty tough. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that uh, people are driven by contribution, right? I think everybody that comes into the world, when they come of age, everybody wants to do something that matters, but everybody doesn't get to that point to where they see it manifest. And so before I get into my presentation, I have to give you the backdrop to how the video that you just witnessed manifested that ESPN did. And so one day I'm downtown Atlanta, me and my friend, a guy by the name of KD, and we're under a bridge. 
And we're with the homeless gentleman, and we're interacting in dialogue, and I have some bread, and I'm giving him some bread. And so me and my wife, we do work with homeless a lot through our foundation. And so I'm there, and I'm interacting with this gentleman, and my phone rings. And so I pull it out, and I look at it, and it's a Connecticut area code. And I don't know anybody from Connecticut, and so I look at KD, and I say, I'll let it ring out. And KD says to me, you probably want to answer that. I said, I don't know anybody from Connecticut. He said, ESPN, duh. I said, well, I don't know anybody at ESPN. I said, but I'll give it a shot. And I answered it. And the guy said, Inky Johnson, Jose Morales, ESPN producer. I said, man, you own to something, OK? <laughs> and the guy asked me, he said, is this really Inky Johnson? I said, yeah, last time I checked, I'm Inky Johnson. He said, is this the same guy that said, if you could change what happened to you, you wouldn't? I said, I wouldn't change it for nothing in the world. He said, it's our understanding at ESPN that the game of football meant the world to you. I said, yeah, at one point it did. He said, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm under a bridge working with the homeless gentleman. He said, so you mean to tell me you're a projected first-round draft pick, and if you could be in the NFL right now making millions of dollars, you wouldn't change that? I said, I wouldn't change it for nothing in the world. He said, I'm coming to see you. I said, come on, I'm in Atlanta. He said, no, I don't want to see you in Atlanta. I want to see you on the exact yard line where you almost lost your life, and I want you to tell me that. I said, I'll meet you in Neyland. I meet him in Neyland Stadium. He walks in. He has the film crew to hang back, and he walks over to me, and he says to me, Inky, I want you to understand one thing. I'm not here because of your story. At ESPN, we see stories all the time. I said, cool, why are you here then? He said, I'm here because for the life of me, me and the guys that I work with, we can't understand your perspective. He said, we can't understand that something that so many people consider to be a tragedy and something that so many people consider to be opposition and something that so many people thought would break you because of what the game of football meant to you, you don't view it that way. And he said, I'm going through some personal problems on my own with my family. And he said, I just can't look at it with the perspective that you look at your situation with. And so can you please help me with some understanding of why you view life that way? And I told them, you probably would never view my situation the way I view it because you didn't go through it. I said, but personally, the reason I can tell you that I view my situation the way that I do because I believe I'm here with a purpose and a mission that's a lot greater than any adversity, opposition, or challenge, and so my perspective about it will always be different. <laughs> you see, I like to ask people, I'm a straight shooter, and I like to ask people the question, what is it really about? Like when you cut through the fluff about what you want and what you're trying to accomplish, like at the core of it, what is it really about? Is it about something superficial, materialistic? Is it about a financial number? Well, what happens when you get it? Like at the core of it, what is it really about? And I've worked with a lot of athletes. I do a lot of professional work. I'm be with the Denver Broncos this Friday. And I ask guys all the time, like, man, what do you really want out of life? Some guys say, man, I want to be rich. I say, cool. I said, the true measure of being rich is how much would you be worth if you lost the money? Some people say, man, I want a house, I want a car. I say, cool, I'm not here to judge. But I really want you to search on what do you really want out of this thing called life. And my journey started for me when I was seven years old, and I thought what I wanted was the NFL. I really felt with every fiber of my being, man, if I could just make it to the NFL, I grew up on the east side of Atlanta in Kirkwood, and now Kirkwood is a lot different than it is back when I grew up in Kirkwood. <laughs> a lot different. They got a ping pong table at the park, right? He had no ping pong table when I grew up. <laughs> and I was coming up in this two-bedroom home with 14 people. And I was sleeping on the floor. Me and my cousins, we made pallets every night, three sheets of cover. And I had this dream that, man, if I could just make it to the NFL, I could get my mother off of that double shift at Wendy's. Like, man, if I could make it to the NFL, me and my cousins, we won't have to miss meals some nights. If I could just make it to that NFL, man, Everything would make sense. And every night, me and my cousins, we would be in the street playing ball, tackle football, getting after it in the street, bloody, scarred up. And one night, we're in the, in the street playing, tackling each other, busting each other up. And we knew every night when the street lights came on, we had about 10 minutes before we had to go in the house. And this night, we're getting after it, and a blue pickup truck comes down the street. I'll never forget it. And we back out of the way to let the car go by, and he pulls over to the curb, and out of it gets the first white guy we had ever saw in our neighborhood at the time. And immediately, every drug dealer on the corner, they take off running. 
And my uncle Bobo, who's doing 40 years at the federal penitentiary right now, looks at me and says, Ink, don't talk to him. God got to be the police. God just so happened to be the nicest guy in the world. If that same guy that got out of that truck called me today and said, Inky, I'm in California and I got a problem. I'm going to find the first flight out to California and we're going to handle that problem. He means that much to me. And he walks up in the middle of our game and he says, um, hey, man, would you all like to play organized football? I said, man, I would love that, man. This street getting rough. Where you been, brother? <laughs> like, man, I love the game, but this street. He said, go in the house and get your guardian. I ran in the house. My uncle JJ had just married into the family. I said, hey, uncle, will you please come and speak to this gentleman? My uncle said, sure. My uncle walked outside. The guy extended his hand. He said, hey, man, my name is Trey Hurst. He said, I don't even supposed to be over here. He said, I dropped the kid home three blocks up, just riding down to check out the neighborhood. He said, I run a league across town. I think if you bring the kids out, I think it'll be a great opportunity for them and it could really help them. My uncle said, sir, we greatly appreciate it, but we just don't have the money for anything like that. And he pointed at me because I was standing right in front of the coach, and he said, his mother said she's working a double shift at Wendy. She definitely doesn't have it. And the coach said, I tell you what, if you bring him and the other three to the park, he pointed at my three younger cousins, you bring them to the park tomorrow, he said, I'll pay for it. Next day, my uncle brought us to the park. I stood there in line, and I watched this guy that I didn't know from Adam take cash out of his own pocket, and he paid for me and my three younger cousins to play ball. And in my family, the only people that went to college was me and my three younger cousins that he paid for in that street that day. But I wanted to understand the man behind the actions. Because where I came from, people didn't operate like that. Like most of the time, it's a catch-22. Like it's very rare that people do things, and it's just pure, right? And it's just who they are, and it's their essence. And so one night when he took me home, I got out, and I'm standing on the sidewalk, and my, my house was 125 Warren Street. And I'm standing on the sidewalk in front of my house, and I said, Coach, can I ask you a question? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And he gets out of his truck. He walks around face to face, and he said, what you got, Ink? I said, Coach, why do you do what you do? I said, because you don't just do it for me. You do it for any kid you meet that's in need. Like, this is just who you are. Like, I've watched you. I've studied you. Why do you really do what you do, and why do you live your life that way? And he said to me, he said, Son, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't want you to ever forget it. And it was so simple but yet so profound. And he said, son, as long as you make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, your life will always be okay. And he got out of his truck and he left. And it shaped the trajectory of my life because the way I processed it was, Inc., as long as what you do and what you're connected to serves a greater purpose than just yourself, son, you will always trample the opposition. You will always trample the adversity. You will always trample the challenges of life when people look at you and say, why do you view it the way that you do? I view it the way that I do because I understand the mission and the purpose that's attached to it. I'm here because I understand this one thing. Everybody I meet is fighting a battle that I know nothing about, and I don't have to change their life. I don't believe I'm that self righteous but if I could just leave them a little bit different and make them think why I respond and why I live my life the way that I do, my job is done. And I'll never forget when I was a freshman in high school, I faced my toughest challenge as a kid. I attended Krim High School on the east side of Atlanta, Atlanta Public School. Some of you all may know about it. At the time when I was attending Krim, they called it Crime High in Atlanta. And when I was in the eighth grade about the transition to my freshman year of high school, everybody knew I was an athlete, and so they would ask me the question, Inky, do you want to go to college? I would say, of course. They would say, what high school are you going to? I would say, Krim. I said, man, don't nobody go to, high, go to college from Krim, man. You might want to go somewhere else. I said, right up, it's right up the street from my house. Inky, nobody goes to college from Krim. I said, man, it's right up the street from my house. So many people asked me that same question and made that same statement that I became numb to it. Until one day, we're riding down Memorial Drive, and I'm in the car with my mother, a Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, car just beat up. And we're riding by Krim, and my mother looks over at me, and she says, son, do you want to go to college? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm going to college. I'm going D1. She said, what high school do you want to go to? I said, I'm going to Krim. She said, ain't the chances. It's slim to none. I said, it's right up the street from my house. <laughs> I said, they got my mother believing that? I said, now I got to go. And the first day I got to the doors, there were cops at, at the door. They're searching kids like we're going into a prison. 
They got metal detectors. They're searching kids from the crown of their head to the bottom of their feet. You got to hold out your arms. You got to look up at the ceiling. And I'll never forget, I stepped to the door. I'm getting searched. I got my arms out. I got my head up. He gets to my feet, and he's coming back up my body. And he poses the question, what's your plan, little man? I said, man, I'm going D1. I'm going to college. He said, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. And he went to walk off. I walked with him. I tapped his arm. He turned around. I said, you got the wrong guy. He said, no, I know about you. Sarcasm kicks in. He said, didn't you have two uncles that came to the same school? I said, yes, sir. He said, weren't they little athletes just like you? Like people talked about them and how they could play sports and all that? I said, yes, sir. He said, aren't they serving 13 and 40 years at the federal penitentiary, not even 10 minutes away from these front doors? I said, yes, sir. He said, absolutely, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You'll probably end up in cell block D1. Walked off. I walked with him. <laughs> I tapped his chest. He turned around. I said, I'm telling you, you got the wrong guy. He said, we'll see. I said, we will. And when I got my scholarship from Tennessee, you know, the first person I went to see. Yeah. That cop. I went to him, and he said something to me, and it rang so true. I slid my paper across the table to him, and he stood up, and he said, I want to ask you a question. How did you do it? He said, every kid that comes in these doors, they say that, but they end up selling drugs across the street at the gas station, or they end up going to prison, going to jail, like everybody wants something out of life. He said, the reason I said that to you, he said, I want you to understand something. I'm here every day. He said, you see me in this school every day protecting, stopping fights. He said, the only reason I said it to you, he said, I wasn't even trying to break you. I said it to you to see would you be willing to fight for what you said you wanted. I just wanted to see would you be willing to fight for the thing that you said you wanted when somebody came at you and they tried to crush you and say because of your family history, because of your lineage, you're probably going to end up just like them. I wanted to see would you be willing to fight for what you said you wanted. And I find it amazing, man, how in life people say, man, I'm going to do something. I'm on fire. I'm committed to it. But a change in circumstance, a change in situation, I don't get what I thought I was going to get. And now the words that I once spoke, they mean nothing to me. I find that amazing. How when a person says they're going to do something and the only thing that has to take place is the circumstance and the situation to change and now the words that they spoke, it means nothing. Now the mission that they once set out on to change the world or impact people, it means nothing to them. The mission isn't stronger than the opposition. They're not committed beyond circumstance. It's compartmentalized. As long as everything go great, I'm all good and I'm in it. I'm sold out with you. And I got told what commitment is, commitment is staying true to what you said you would do long after the mood that you set it in has left. Meaning when I don't feel like doing what I said I'm going to do, I'm still going to get up and I'm still going to do it. One thing about it, character is not something that you're born with. Character is something that you get up every single day, you fight and you build it. And when I got to Tennessee, it was a cakewalk for me. Like, I've never played a hard day of football in my life. Like, it's football. It's recreation. Like, I was with the Knicks. I walked out. I said, do you all realize you get paid to play basketball? And coming into my junior year, I get my paperwork back from the NFL, and I'm a projected first-round draft pick. Who knew? Kid from a two-bedroom home, 14 people. Grandmother go to church every Sunday sit in the same spot, everybody that crosses her face. You know my grandson, Anki? Yes, ma'am, Miss Daisy. He's about to go to the NFL. My mother, everybody she meets, you remember little Anki? Yes, ma'am, he's about to go to the NFL. Now come out my first game, have a great game, interception, execute. Second game, we're playing against Air Force. Gets late in the game with battling, Air Force, tough group of guys, discipline group of guys, great group of guys. And it's a little bit over two minutes left in the game. And we all know when you're watching a ball game, you get to about two minutes left in the game. The game is basically over unless you're playing against Peyton Manning or Tom Brady, Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> all right, 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 right. Yeah. And, um, 
Right, yeah, that's a tough one. I'm still battling that one, right? As a fresh wound. And the quarterback just so happens to drop back, and he releases the ball to a guy coming down my sideline, and my plan was to annihilate the guy, separate him from the ball in the game. And as soon as I made contact with the guy and hit him, I knew something was wrong. It seemed as if every breath of my body left, my body went completely limp. I fell to the ground, I blacked out. That had never happened to me before. My eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. They said, Ink, get up, let's rock, let's close it out, let's go. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, this is your game, you kamikaze. Let's go, you can nurse your injury after the game. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? Man, we need you. I said, man, you don't get, there's a shock going from my neck to my toes, I can't feel anything. And the shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. I remember they brought the spine board out, put me on it, they're willing me off to the field. We get to about right there by the ambulance. My father is standing there and he's looking at me, but he's looking like he's seen a ghost. And I say to my father, Pops, I got him, right? And he said, yeah, son, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They get me up in ambulance. They say, Inky, we're going to take you over, run a couple tests, bring you back into the room. Everything will be okay. And they get me over. They run the test. They bring me back into the room. My mother comes in, kisses me, prays for me. Son, you'll be okay. Everything will be fine. It's football. And before she could step out of the room, doctors came running from the opposite side. And the lead doctor says, guys, get in here. We got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I'm looking at him. And I wanted to say, man, you can't use another word. Like, use <laughs> man, use a synonym, man. Like, come on, man. Like, die, man. You're like, I don't know if anybody in here ever died, but you start thinking about everything. Like, I don't even have dogs and cats. I'm thinking about dogs and cats. Right? And he can tell how I'm looking at him that I'm questioning him. And he responds, you ruptured up some clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. We don't take you back and perform surgery right now. He said, you won't be here in the morning. And the next morning when I woke up, can I tell you something? The game of football on my scale of life was that big. The NFL, that big. I was embarrassed. Like people were coming into my room saying, Inky, man, sorry about what happened to you. And I'm like, man, Ink, was that it? Like, that's all you really wanted? Was a contract from the NFL, take care of your family, contribute back to your community. Like, that was it? You thought because you grew up a certain type of way, that was the only thing you really wanted? Like, I was in a steel mill a couple of weeks ago doing some work. Like, I'm big on culture, I'm big on environment, right? Like, I believe an environment would change an individual before an individual changes an environment. And I walked into there, and I said, man, what's the culture here? Like, how do we get down? How do we rock, man? And the guy looked at me, he said, man, we come in, we make a little steel, we make a little money, and we go back home. And he looked at me and he said, is that a problem? I said, no, sir, it isn't. I can't tell you how to do what you do, how you do it. You're the, you're the expert at that. I said, but I do got one slight thing. I said, we got two gentlemen in the same building that's lost their lives because we come in, we make a little steel, we make a little money, and we go back home. And so the first time an individual got an opportunity to take a shortcut, they took it, and a 15,000-pound nail fell out of the ceiling, and it split a guy in half. And so now a son doesn't have a father because we come in, we make a little steel, we make a little money, and we go back home. Now a wife doesn't have a husband because we come in, we make a little steel, and we make a little money, and we go back home. So yet, yeah, actually, I do got a problem with this. And I felt like that was my life with the game of football. I just got up every day, went through drills, and man, I'm going to make it to the NFL. That's a be, that'll be it. No value, no substance, nothing. Like I was efficient, but not effective. I did things right, but I never did the right thing. Efficient, not effective. Hollow, jelly bean, hard on the outside, soft on the inside, don't possess nothing. There's a quote that says, when do a person start to really live? When a person has encountered death, now I'd encountered death and I had survived it, and I guarantee you, it was literally as if somebody pulled the shades up on my life and they said, now you see life for what it's really worth. You thought it was about the NFL, now you really see life for what it's really worth. Like I thought I was driven when I played sports, but man, every day I get up that drive different. Like that dedication level different, that commitment level is different. Like at the end of the day, we all in the same business, that's the people's business. 
Like every single day, I get up to impact lives. That is why I go at life with the drive, the dedication, and the commitment level that I do. Because if somebody can look at me, it was kind of like when I was a kid and I would stare at my grandmother after we didn't eat the night before and her ritual and her routine never changed. She still got up and she still prayed at the same time. She still broke out the Bible at the same time. She still said to me every, t- every single day I walked out of the house in Quarius, learn from the mistakes of other people. You can't make them all yourself. Like she never changed. And I said, I want that. I don't know what that is, but I want to possess that when I miss a meal and I still can be steadfast and I still can get up and go through my routine. And what I was saying was, in life, I want to possess that, that when adversity, opposition, and the thing that should have crushed me, I step back, I embrace it and say, life, that's all you got? This was your best shot? It's over with. It's kind of like in a match when you throw that best shot and he stepped back and he tasted that blood and he said, that was it. You in trouble. And I'm going to leave you with this story about two guys in business that did very well, very successful, crushed it. And it got toward the latter years of their life and they became terminally ill. And they placed them in a facility basically to die. And in this facility, every single day, they had a common area. They would come out, they would have fun, they would play games, they would eat food. They would just have a big time, crack jokes. And two of the gentlemen, they got really cool. So they asked the nurse, they said, hey, nurse, can you put us in the same room? Me and my guy, we hit it off. She's like, yeah, cool, sure. So she put them in the same room, and so the beds were set up. One guy's bed was to my right, your left, and to my left, your right. And every single day, brought them the same thing to eat, same thing to drink. But the guy with the bed to my left, your right, it was by a window. So every day after they would do their thing, the guy on the opposite side would say, hey, man, tell me, what do you see out that window? And his buddy would say, man, I see a beautiful skyline. He said, man, I see beautiful children running, playing, holding hands. Man, beautiful couples walking, talking, beautiful flowers. This guy would say, man, thank you so much, man. That really helped. One day, nurse came in, guy with the bed by the window had died. She was rolling him out, and as she's rolling him out, buddy on the opposite side said, hey, nurse, can you do me a favor? She said, yeah, what is it? He said, whenever you put my guy wherever you got to put him, can you come back and will you please put my bed by that window? I want the opportunity to lift myself up and see what my guy used to tell me about it really helped me in my situation. He said, sure. A couple days later, she came back. She rolled his bed by the window, brought him something to eat, something to drink. He finally got the strength. He lifted himself up. He looked out of that same window, and the only thing he saw was a brick wall. He started yelling, screaming, nurse, nurse, can you come in here? Nurse came running, what is it? He said, you remember my guy? She said, yeah, of course. So he used to tell me about these beautiful flowers, beautiful kids, couples, walking, holding hands. Like, I really want to see that. Can we please get this whole wall removed? He wanted the whole wall removed, right? And the nurse looked back at him, and she said, um, you didn't know? He said, no, ma'am, no what? She said, you really didn't know? He said, no, ma'am, no what? She said he was blind. She said he couldn't have seen that even if he wanted to. She said, you really didn't know. Every day he did that because he knew it brought you joy. Every day he did it because he knew it brought you peace. Every day he did it because he knew it brought you happiness. He was about to die himself, but he had a blind guy that lifted himself up, looked out of a window, and painted a picture that he couldn't even see because he knew it brought joy, happiness, and peace to another individual. And so as I leave you today with my 24 seconds, I have to pose the question, why do we really do what we do and where is it taking us? Like, what's the GPS that's on the end of our decisions and our choices every single day? Because I think we all know when the rubber meets the road, it's about two things. It isn't about anything superficial, materialistic, that's hollow. At the end of the day, it's about who we become, and it's about what we give. And every single day, the process is happening constantly in life through opposition, through adversity, and through challenges. But I'm a firm believer, courage is the ability to start something without any guarantee of success. Go get it. Thank you. God bless you.